Uh, we're going to talk about the book of Esther, so if you want to turn to the book of Esther, we can just uh, uh, get started there. Esther is the book right after Nehemiah. Yeah, Ezra, Nehemiah, and then Esther. So if you find any of those, we're, that's where we're going to be going in. So first of all, uh, uh, Esther is about uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Jewish nations, the, uh, the Jewish people, they celebrate a holiday called Purim. How many of y'all know what Purim is? How many don't know who Purim is? Okay, Purim, Purim uh, the word Purim, uh, which is actually the correct way of pronouncing it, but everybody says Purim. So uh, we, we can, even the, even the Jewish people say Purim, but uh, it's actually Purim. But Parim is plural, so when you see the I-M on the end of the word, it, that's a plural form. And so it's plural. So the singular of that is pur. But pur, pur is a, uh, is a word that means uh, a chance. That's what it means. Um, they still, the Jewish people still use it. It's, a, it's actually a, um, a Persian word that was borrowed uh, into the Hebrew language. But, uh, and so the... the uh, pur is a lot. For instance, like a, like a, a set of dice, when you have two dice, I'm entering a couple of dice, but I forgot got to do it. When you have two dice, you have uh, one, one, one die, and then you have two dice. Okay, dice is the plural of die. And so, uh, if, uh, if, it's just like you would cast the, the, the dice, and they would roll up two different numbers, this is what happened here in this book, is that they actually cast a lot. They, when it says they cast a lot, they, they were, the word for lot there is the word poor, so they cast the poor. We, they cast the dice. They threw the dice. Okay. There's many ways of, of doing that. You can do it by you can do it by uh, pulling a number out of a hat. There's a lot of ways of, of, of doing that. Uh, but basically, they it was left up to chance. Uh, so we're going we're going to talk about that before before I get into that. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll just show you this, and then we'll then we'll do this next part. But. There is, an, there is a, another uh, Hebrew holiday that where they cast lots. Does anybody know what holiday that is? Does anybody know? When? <laughs> they, they cast lots on the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur. They cast lots. What they do is they bring two goats in. You have, and they are both identical. And it's a very important. The scriptures say that they have to be they have to be identical goats. You see, it's easy to choose. It would be easy to choose one goat over the other if one goat was better than the other, if one goat was taller than the other, or if one goat was well, had, had a different skin color than the other. But they had to find two goats that, for all intents and purposes, that that those two goats are are like twins. Because now it has to be left up to God who chooses the goat, and so they they the they had the in the breastplate of the high priest they have this thing called the urim and the thummim, and the urim and the thummim uh, it stands for lights and perfections. That's what it stands for. But the high priest would then pay, uh, reach in and out of the, in this bag, and he would pull out one one stone, and if and the the black stone would be for Azazel, for removal. Azazel is the Hebrew for removal. And so one goat would be, be identified as for removal. The other goat, then, would be the one that would be uh, be, picked, uh, be set aside for sacrifice. Now this is very interesting because they would choose these two goats because they were, they were absolutely equal. And because, because they could not choose any other way, they left it up to God to choose. Now the one goat that is choose for Azazel, they would lay their hands upon that goat, they would confess all the sins of the, of, the, of the nation of Israel upon that goat, and they would drive that goat into the wilderness, and, and the goat would never be found again. It was called, yeah, then the King James is called scapegoat. Uh, it's a re real, really poor... Uh, Poor translation. The word is actually Azazel instead of scapegoat. It is actually it is the escape goat. Okay, that's why where we get escape, they just shorten the escape. Okay, it's the one that escaped. But uh, but the the word is actually uh, removal. 
The word is actually removal. So he is the removal goat. Now here's the interesting thing. God had to give a, a, a symbol that was symbolized who Yeshua was. So he used two goats. He was 100% man, 100% God. He was, as, he was just as much man as he was God. He was just as much God as he was man. Now, isn't this interesting? Yeah. So in Yeshua is the two goats. As man, he could die. He could, be, he could die upon the cross. As God, he could remove sin. He could be the Azazel. Isn't that interesting? So, what happened upon the cross was that God, God the Son, when he, was, when he was there, He removed sin and He sacrificed His, his life. So, the Day of Atonement is a beautiful picture, but I just wanted to point out that, that casting lots is not necessarily a bad thing. Alright? <laughs> so, Now, so we're going to get into the book of Esther. I just want to talk a little bit about, about something, because I believe that Esther is a prophetic book. And so we're going to look at, uh, at Esther in a little bit different, different, uh, different way. It's interesting because um, Esther is kind of like an onion with, with all these layers in it. And you can just kind of peel back a layer after a layer after a layer after a layer. I, I, I will never... I will not be, a, this will not be a in-depth study in the book of Esther. It would take me probably 12, anywhere, 12 to 15 weeks uh, to go through an in-depth study of the book of Esther. So there's no way I can do that in an hour. I can't put 12, 12 weeks of study into, into, into one hour of a, of, of a message. So, as, as a result of that, I'm going to, there's going to be a lot of things that I just can't bring out. Alright, I just can't bring out. And... But the Holy Spirit may, may, may show you show you things as as we go along. And my intent, my hope is, is that you will that you will uh, uh, go on and uh, study study this for yourself. But there is something in the Book of Esther that I want you to notice right off the bat, and we're going to look at this over in Esther chapter nine. All right. Now this is after the uh, this is after they they were they got the decree that, that they could defend themselves and on the 14th day of, of uh, Adar they were defending themselves so I want to go to uh, I'll tell you what I'll just I'll just start in verse nine and uh, verse one and uh, chapter nine verse one now in the 12th month that is the month Adar. On the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution, in the days that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, that it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had ruled over them that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Achasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt, and no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. And all the rulers of the provinces, and all the lieutenants, and the deputies, and officers of the king, helped the Jews, <laughs> because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house. Boy, that's just great. The fear of Mordecai fell upon them. All right. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, and slaughter, and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them. And in Shushan the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. And Parshatatha, and Dalphin, and Aspatha, and Poratha, and Adelia, and Aradatha, and Parmashta, and Arishai, and Eridal, and Vajishtha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they. That's ten, there's ten sons that they slew right there. But on the spoil, laid not, they laid their not of their hand. On that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan the palace was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed five hundred men in Shushan the palace. And the ten sons of Haman, what have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition, and it shall be granted you? Or what is your request further, and it shall be done? 
Then said Esther, If it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are, which are in Sushan to do tomorrow, also according to this day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded it to be done, and the decree was given in Shushan, and to hang Haman's ten sons. Alright, so I want you to, the, the handout that I gave you, now if we can put up that, uh, that scroll, scroll of Esther, no, uh, this scroll is what I want, there we go, alright, so this is the, this is the, this is the Hebrew scroll of the book of Esther, uh, the Torah scroll, the, uh, the word for scroll in Hebrew is Megillah. And every time I think of McGill, I always think of McGill the Gorilla, right? <laughs> <laughs> McGill the Gorilla, you know, the cartoon. Maybe that's where they got the name. I don't know. But uh, but uh, the McGill is uh, is a scroll, and you can see that it's scrolled out here. And this part of, of Esther right here, over in uh, in chapter nine, uh, verses uh, six through ten. I'm sorry, six through nine. This is six through nine right there. Isn't that interesting? How that's written? All right. So I blew that up and gave it to you, and you'll notice there there are some uh, little, little letters there that are in red, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So the rabbis have wondered about this for centuries because this this scroll has been in existence for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, long before for uh, the 1900s. You know, you know this is, goes goes way way back. So they're wondering why it, this is all written because you know they they take they painstakingly write every letter exactly the way it is written because they have to they have to it, it, they can't have any any mistakes and so they always wondered why this was written the way it was i'll use my porn here and if you notice here you have all these are the names of haman's ten sons right here but over here we have this this bob with the olive in the top and uh this is an untranslatable word in Hebrew, it's et, and it literally means strength of the covenant. Uh, the the uh, olive is strong, and and tab is covenant. But uh, and then you have the vav, which is the uh, which is the word and in Hebrew. So this this is not translatable. This particular word here, uh, and of course Yeshua said that he was the olive and the tab. But I don't want to get into that because this this really doesn't have anything to do with Yeshua in this part. This is just an, a direct object pointer in this in this particular case. So it's, it's speaking of these sun sons of the direct object, the receiver of the action. But it's interesting because notice you, uh, we just read that Haman was Haman was already hanged, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, he was hung. He was hung eleven months earlier. Now on this particular uh, on the, this particular day on the fourteenth of uh, of Adar, uh, the second day that they are doing, they they uh, they got these names listed here, and they all listed up here, up and down like this. And so they understood that they, they wrote this this way because they wanted to, to give you a picture of Haman's sons hanging on the gallows. Oh. Yeah, see that. But the question is, why is there two gallows? Why is there a gallow with Haman's son and another gallows over here with with that with 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 that one over there? And so they never understood that. You know, here's the, here's the thing about prophecy. Much of prophecy we can't understand until it's already fulfilled. Yes. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Right. When it gets fulfilled, well, then 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 we notice it. Well, here's the interesting thing. They also the first the first uh, uh, name right here it has a little small tog right there. The seventh name, come on down here. The seventh name has a small sheen. Right there. The last name, the tenth name, has a small zayin. Right there. Small zayin. And then also it has this very unusual, very large vav. Wow. So they they don't they don't know, know this. So they say, well, we don't know what this is, but it has to be prophetic. So what I want to do? Can, I'm going to turn this off just for a second because I want. How do I shut the, this right here? No, no here. Okay, I just want to shut the lens. Okay. All right. So, so here we have we have a tov. 
We have a sheen. And we have a zoddy. And then we have this very long bob over here. A very big bob. bob. So, they understood some things about this. They understood that this is 400 because in Hebrew, the letters are also numbers. So when they write it, if they were to write 400, they would write it with the tell. The sheen is 300, and the dot, the, the, uh, um, I, I want, I, I'm, um, I'll let Bake Gimel Dalla Hay follow Zion. Zion. Zion is seven. Zion is seven. And the Baal is six. If you add this up, you have 707. Well, that don't help as much, does it? Now, you have to understand, Esther is written a long time before the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar does, doesn't exist at the time of Esther. So, these rabbis can't understand what this 707 has to do with anything. Why did they have these letters? And why is this 6 over here so large? And it, these are, that's large and these are small. So they, 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 But they, all they said was, it's prophecy, we just don't know what it means. This is very interesting because when you take 707... You have the year 707, you have the year 1707, you have the year 2707, you have the year 3707, you have the year 4707, you have the year 5707, and you have the year 67, and go on and on and on, right? But this six ball, one, two, three, four, five, six. If we you think that, if we look at it that way, it's the year 5707 in the Hebrew calendar. Mm. Mm. They may know what the year 5707 was in the Gregorian calendar. 1946. 1946. Something happened in 1946. Now, 1946 is shut at the end of the of the World War II. We, we, we have witnessed some of the most horrible things that a man, a person can do to a mankind with Hitler and, and, the, and, the, uh, um, and the Holocaust, the Shoah. And six million people are, are, are murdered, and, and women and children. Jews. Six million Jews. Not to mention other, other uh, nationalities as well, but there were six million Jews that were killed. Fifty-two million and Hitler, Hitler uh, had his his his, uh, his main his main thrust was to uh, was to uh, get, kill the Jews. In fact, he was interviewed. He was interviewed in 1940. And in 1940, they uh, he, they asked him uh, he had asked him about uh, uh, his uh, about what uh, about conscience and, and uh, you know about the conscience of a nation. I don't remember how the the question came about. But he said this. He said, I have no conscience. My conscience is Adolf Hitler. In fact, the World News and the World Report reported that Hitler said that he, the way that he would rebuild Berlin... He wanted to rename the city and uh, call it Germania. Now we talked about we talked about Germania last last, uh, last over the last few days. And he wanted to, and uh, anyway, so that's kind of interesting. That's uh, so so. What here's the interesting thing about Esther chapter nine. Because Esther chapter 9, in verse 13, it says, Then said Esther, if it pleased the king, let it be granted to the Jews, which are at Shushan the palace, to do tomorrow, uh, and also according to this day's decree. And let Haman's sons, ten sons, be hanged upon the gallows. Now, wait a minute. They were killed the day before. Why would Esther want 
to hang Haman's ten sons. They're already dead. Especially when you look at how that was written with, with that being in columns like that, like it got those, it really really makes you makes you wonder, doesn't it? Is there going to be two hangings? Well, after World War II was over, we had the Nuremberg trials in Nuremberg, yes. Germany. Right. Yes. And in uh, in Nuremberg, we can put this back up. In uh, in Nuremberg, they had uh, uh, they they were getting ready to try uh, these men for uh, war crimes, and the the uh, punishment for these war crimes would be hanging. Now the interesting thing is is that when a military trial goes into into effect for for this type of thing, you know the the method of of, of uh, execution is not hanging. The method of execution is firing squad. But this case, the method of execution was hanging. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. That they changed the mode of execution without any understanding, because God's at work here, all right? So there are 11 men that are sentenced to hang to death. The interesting thing is, is that. They were sentenced in the, uh, the earlier part of the year, I believe around in June. But they didn't get, they didn't hang until October the 6th. And the reason was because public opinion was, was, uh, was there was uh, several groups that wanted amnesty, if you can imagine. Seven groups, several people that were begging for amnesty, so it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And finally, on October the 6th, they, they, they were, they were hung. October 6, 1948. October falls fell that year in the month of Tishrei, which is the first month, or I'm sorry, the seventh month of the Hebrew year. It's the month where we have the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast... Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Feast of Tabernacles tells us, is talking about the, the millennial reign of Christ. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles is all about. Sukkot. It's about when he comes and dwells with us on this earth. So, I believe Esther is telling us that the book of Esther is about the end times. Specifically the times just prior to the, to the reign of Christ upon this earth. We're going to look at that in just a little deeper here in just a minute. But here we have... Haman's son's hanging. But there's 11 people. There's 11 people that are... So this doesn't fit, does it? Well, can we turn to the next uh, next slide there? This, yep. This is the headline. Goring, Goring ends life by poison. Ten others hanged in Nuremberg prison for Nazi war crimes. Goring, they still don't know how, he, how, how it happened, but he got some cyanide in, uh, into a cell somehow or another. And he killed himself by suicide. And that left ten men to be hung. Now that's just, that's just coincidental, right? But here's the interesting thing. All of the ten men, with the exception of one, the very last man, went up to the gallows with, with dignity and honor. The last man, by the name of Stryker, he was dragged up the gallows steps. He was fighting and, and carrying on and going, going crazy. He gets up on there and he, his last words, he said something about loving his wife. And then he said this, Purim Fest, 1940. Six. Now the interesting thing is the striker was the uh, intelligence officer for for, uh, for Hitler, and so Hitler and Stryker they would do a lot of a lot of propaganda. There was a lot of propaganda in those days. There was a lot a lot of pornographic material that they put out 
some really horrific, horrible, horrible material. But they put that out as propaganda, you know, to turn people's uh, uh, stomachs against the Jewish people. And so, uh, uh, and they would talk a lot about uh, about Purim, the two of them would. That both Hitler and Stryker understood Purim. And Hitler, Hitler then uh, was, uh, was talk, was, they would talk with each other, and Hitler is, 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 uh, is quoted as saying that if he was to fail, it would be another pearl. If he was not to, able to extinguish all the Jews, it would be another pearl. So he saw himself as Haman. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Now this is just a little. This is a, maybe about a year and a half before before they become a nation. Because this is October, they become a nation in June of 1948. So about a year and a half later, they become they become a, a nation. There is a. Uh, This is kind of interesting. Let's go to the Jan Daniel chapter. Keep your, keep your, uh, don't, don't lose Esther. We don't want to lose Esther. I'm going to put my little, little uh, thing over here with Esther. All right. So let's go over to Daniel seven verse twenty four. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall, shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. Let's go over to Revelation 17, 12. Revelation 17, 12. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, which have received no kingdoms yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Then let's go to 13, verse 1. Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sands of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So let's go back, let's 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 talk about let's go talk about Haman again. Haman is the Agagite. Well, the Agag, Agag was a king. He was the king of the Amalekites. Hundreds of years earlier, we have uh, Saul yes. fighting against the Amalekites. God had told Saul, he said, this is, and here's the thing about the Amalekites, because the Amalekites, the Amalekites didn't just, just appear on the scene. They actually, they actually started a long time ago. The Amalekites, the Amalek is the grandson of Esau. Esau married a Canaanite woman. And one of his concubines had, had, had a son who had a son that was named Amalek. So literally what we have here with Haman is ha Haman, who is an Agagite, but Agag goes all the way back to Amalek. Amalek goes all the way back to Esau, and of course we know what he's, Esau, Esau and Jacob, right? And the, and the tension between Esau and Jacob. Jacob has his name changed to, changed to Israel, so it's Esau and Israel. And here again we have we have Amalek showing up his head again. The first time that we we, we see Amalek is when Israel is coming out of Egypt. <laughs> On Passover. They're coming out of Egypt, and Amalek attacks attacks them. It's over seven hundred miles from where Amalek's land is to where the children of Israel are. Yet they crossed over Saudi Arabia, came all the way 700 miles to attack Israel. Israel had, was not even close to their land, wasn't even interested in their land. There was no fight over water rights. There was nothing, there was no reason for Amalek to travel 700 miles. To, but Amalek was, hated Israel so much, when he saw them come out of Israel, out of Egypt, he saw that his chance to attack the weak side of it, and it, and we had this battle there where, where the sun stood still, right? Because because Moses had lifted up his hands to heaven. And God said, because hands were lifted up to heaven, I will have war with Amalek forever. So now, jump forward a few hundred years. Now we got, we got Saul now. God tells Saul, 
I want you to take the Amalekites. Amalekites, I want you to destroy them. I want to destroy every one of them. He saves. He 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 takes the spoil. He takes he takes the sheep and the goats and, and everything. He, he wasn't supposed to do it. They they were they killed everything. Everything. But he takes the spoil. Yeah. And then he saves Agag, King Agag, alive. Samuel comes up. He says, he says, what have you done? He said, well, I've obeyed the Lord. He said, what is this bleeding of the sheep that I hear in my ears? And who is this King Agag that you still see? He's still alive. And Samuel then hacks Agag to pieces. Anybody want to be a prophet? Go over there and hacking people with the pieces? <laughs> okay. That's Old Testament, right? Alright, so so now now we have the, the egg egg seed now is is now Haman. Isn't this so amazing? Later on we have Hitler. After that we have the Antichrist. The Amalekite spirit that was in Haman. The Amalekite, the Amalek spirit, Amalek spirit that was in Haman. The one that is in Hitler will be the same one that's in the Antichrist. They want to destroy all those that are followers of the Yahweh. But notice. She said, tomorrow, let this be done again. Now, tomorrow is an interesting word. Because when's tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow is tomorrow. It, 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 tomorrow never comes, right? Tomorrow is always, always in the future. And so Esther is literally, by the, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how, how, how she even understood this, but she asked, she said, tomorrow let it be done again. And let Haman's sons be hanged. Let there be a, let there be a second time. Wow. It's amazing. The Jewish people say that there, are, there, is, there is a, uh, in every generation, there is someone that wants to, just, wants to kill all the Jews. And I'm going to tell you something this, and I'll go even further. I believe in every generation, Satan has an end of life. Yes. Because he doesn't know the date or the hour. He doesn't know when this is going to wrap up. He has no clue when Yeshua is going to come back. He has no clue. So in every generation, he has an Antichrist spirit. He has a person that is ready and waiting, just jumping upon on the scene, ready to go. All right, let's. Uh, I don't think I do. I, I don't know if I got any more slides. Do I have any more slides there? I think that's it, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you had the map. Oh, I had the map. All right. Yeah, put the map up, and then we'll. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Queen Esther. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna call you Queen Esther for now on. All right. So we know where we're talking about. See, this, this is Israel right here. This is Persia. This is Susa, Susa the palace. This is, where the, this is where Esther takes place. This is Israel. This is also during the time of Daniel's prophecy with the, with the statue. The Medes and the Persian. This is about 150 years. Esther is about 150 years before uh, Alexander the Great. And his and his army came through and set up the Greek uh, Greek kingdom, approximately 150 years, roughly. So I just want you to see that that's quite a distance from Israel. So they were they literally were taking taken into into Babylon, and now they they uh, Esther is in Susa the palace. All right, so let's uh, let's step that off, and now we can now we can get into this. 
So let's go over to Esther again. And let's just kind of walk through this book of Esther. Okay, Esther's name, Esther's name uh, is, a, is, is a pagan name, it's the, it's the uh, a Persian name. Oh, by the way, Persia is uh, present-day Iran. And who is it that's shouting death to Israel, death to America? Iran. Iran. Amadine, uh, job is that his name? Something like that? Anyway. You have the, and who is who is it that's trying to get a get uh, the nuclear power? Who who we find, who who is it that's trying to do this? You, you see why you see why Israel was so so disturbed when President uh, uh, Obama was uh, was was making this agreement with with uh, Iran concerning this nuclear nuclear deal because they saw another Purim. Coming up, mm. for all the Jews, would be, there, would, there would be a plan to destroy all the Jewish people again. And make no mistake, that's exactly what Iran wants to do. It wants to destroy not only Israel, but it wants to destroy America, because America is the greatest. Is, 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 is there's two reasons. There's two reasons. One, because we're the greatest ally of Israel. The second reason is because we are Ephraim. They're right. Whether they understand it or know that or not, that that's the truth of it. That's the spiritual aspect of it. So don't you think, don't think. That's why we should pray for the peace of Israel, by the way, because I'll tell you something. Whatever has happens to Israel is going to come our way too. We're not going to escape anything that happens to Israel. All right. Man, if God, you know, if, 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 if these other, if these other nations, these other world powers, if they, if they were, if they rose and, and went, went away, what do you, why do you think that America is going to stay forever? Mm. Just, a, just a thought, just a thought. All right. I talked about this, I want to go back just for a second because I talked about this being 1946, right? Or 19, yeah, 1946. There was another scripture that I wanted to go to. And uh, it's over in Leviticus 25, verse 10. Leviticus 25, verse 10. Leviticus 25, verse 10. It says, And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all of the land, unto the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. The word for return there, let me get, let me get it up here so I, I don't make a mistake, is of uh, to bait and bob. This word is chuba. It's actually got a, a little bit of a. It's a different form of speech. Form of speech, but but the but the but the root of the word is shuv here. But this word should be written this way. Tav, Sheen, Bav, Beit, and Bav. Anybody notice the difference? So this is the this is the correct way of writing it. This is the way it is written. You notice it's missing of all? Missing of all. Missing Bob. Bob is six, right? Tav is 400. Sheen is 300. Bait is two. And Bob is six. Seven, oh, eight.
And again, we have this, the evolve, which is 6. So that tells us it's the 57, 5708. 5708 is 1948. Now, let's read that again with that understanding. And you shall howl the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto the net. This is the... This is the uh, the uh, uh, the Yobel, where everything is, is, is returned back. The land and everything is returned back. It shall be a jubilee unto you. You shall return every man into his possession. And you shall return every man into his family. And what happened in 1948? Israel became a nation. And they returned back to their possession. But here's the interesting thing. Why, why, why the missing law? Because they were, when they returned back, they were missing six million of their people. Leviticus, I tell you, that the Bible is just full of, of unbelievable things that are just right in front of us. All right, so let, let's talk about Esther now. When uh, when the Jewish people have a have a feast, they have a, they have a little saying that they that they go that that uh, every every feast is uh, is uh, uh, goes this way. They tried to kill us. God delivered us. Let's eat. Okay. Well, that's the story in a nutshell, right? They tried to kill us. God delivered us. Let's eat. All right. Because they, they always have they always have food with everything. All right. The Book of Esther. The, 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 what, uh, it fits between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7. So if you're reading the book of Ezra, Ezra, just know that between chapter 6 and chapter 7, the book of Esther happens. Because Esther is contemporary with Nehemiah, Ezra, with Zerubbabel, with, uh, with all of these other people. That, because it, it was just a, a few years prior to this that, they, that, he, uh, that, that the... Uh, uh, that they, uh, um, the other king, uh, the one that was prophesied, to, oh Cyrus, the king Cyrus gave them uh, gave them permi uh, commandment and permission to go back and to rebuild the city. So, the, so that's what's happening. You've got you've got some people that are over in Israel. They travel all the way from Shushan to Palace, all the way over to Israel. And there, in fact, Nehemiah he has a vision, and he sees himself in Shushan the palace in a vision. Over in Nehemiah, he talks about that. He said, I was in Shushan the palace. Well, no, he was. He was over in Israel. But, he, but God transported him to Shushan the palace. So these two, these two things are, are going on. So you've got, you, once we understand that, it's, it's interesting because... Uh, so Esther happens, happens in there. Now, Mordecai and Esther are both pagan names. They're both, uh, they're both names out of the... Out of the uh, uh, the Persian Empire, the both Persian. Esther, the Mordecai, we don't know what his Hebrew name was, but we know what Esther's Hebrew name was. Esther's Hebrew name was Hadassah. Now names are important in the Bible. In fact, you ought to just sometimes just go through and and look at the meanings of every one of these names. It really is it really is uh, phenomenal. But uh, but Esther Esther uh, the word Esther in in uh, in the uh, in, in the language of the Persians, means star. Means star. That that kind of uh, that kind of interesting to me that her name means star. The uh, uh, let me let me find this here. If I want, want, to, want to, because uh, there was a a star. Daniel 12.3. Let's, let's just read that. Daniel 12.3. And they shall be they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That's that's what Israel is going to do right here. Then we have uh, Numbers 24, 24, 17. Numbers 24, 17. Numbers 24, 17. 
Now this is uh, uh, this is uh, Balaam, and uh, he's uh, he's he was paid to curse curse uh, Israel, but instead he couldn't curse them; he had to bless them. He says he says this: I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter. That kind of reminds you of, of Esther, right? The scepter. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Now that, that's very interesting because we're going to talk about the scepter in, in Esther in just a moment. But a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and shall destroy the children of Shem. All right, let's go. Let's go to Deuteronomy 31 because in the book of Esther, Deuteronomy 31, in the book of Esther, God's name is doesn't appear. There's two books in the Bible where God's name doesn't appear. The book of the Song of Solomon's. Uh, uh, the Song of Songs, uh, Shir Hashirim, and also uh, the book of Esther. God does not appear. The name God does not appear. Now I say it doesn't appear, but it actually appears four times, but it's in an acrostic. Uh, and in fact, just, just really, really quick here before we go to the Deuteronomy, I'll talk about the acrostic here. The, uh, In verse 120, where it says the wife shall give, talking about the wife shall give, the wife shall give honor. Uh, if you look at the at the uh, first letters of that name of, of each word there, where it says the wife shall give, the wife shall give, each each letter spells out yod heh vav heh, but it's backwards. It's it's yud heh vav heh, but it's backwards. The name of Yahweh is backwards. In chapter five, verse four. Where it says that let the king come come with Haman, you you look at the uh, look at the first letters of each each word, and this one's normal. It's yud hey vav hey the way way the way you would normally write it. Then in five then in five thirteen, where it says the last letter of this is uh, the I'm sorry, uh, it says of this is no avail to me. Uh, the last letter of, of that of phrase, where it says, this is no avail to me, that, that Haman is saying, then the name of Yahweh in the last letters is backwards. And in 7 verse 7, where he says, he saw that there was evil determined, this is Haman again, the last letter of that, each last letter of each word of that phrase, spells the word yod heh vah in a normal fashion, in the in, uh, right to left. These are the only four times where you can do that in the book of Esther. But there are four times. Four is the number for Dalet. Isn't that interesting? Dalet is the fourth one, and Dalet is the door. And Yeshua said, I am the door. And John, I am the door. I am the Dalet. I am the fourth. Isn't that interesting? All right, so that's, that's kind of interesting. But So the name of God doesn't appear. It just appears in hidden form. Because this is a, a, a this is a a, a a prediction over in uh, in Deuteronomy chapter thirty one verse eighteen Deuteronomy thirty one eighteen says and I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought in that they have turned unto other gods. Where it says, hide my face, is the word Hester Panim. It is literally spelled like Esther, but it's, but it's, it's a different form. So you have, es you have Esther and Hester. See the familiarity there? Yeah. So Esther, which means star, is also meaning hidden. Right. And the root of the word, uh, both, both of those, is, is, uh, is the word uh, for hidden. So God would hide his face. Yeah. So literally he was hiding his face in the book of Esther. The, um, uh, so Hester, uh, Hester Panim. So, but but Esther, also, uh, her Jewish name was Hadassah. Hadassah means myrtle. Myrtle. Go over to Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 15. Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 15. It says, And they that should publish and proclaim in all the cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches, the branches of thick trees to make booths or sukkots. 
as it is written. So this is the piece of Sukkot, and they take myrtle, myrtle branches and put them on there. They put Esther upon their upon their dwelling. It's interesting. They put Hadassah on their on their dwellings, and that is when in the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the millennial reign. So Esther is telling us again that her book has to do with the last days. Wow. All right. Zechariah 1 also talks about the myrtle trees and about how that there, there, and he saw, he saw, he saw, uh, in fact, let's just go to Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah 1, and uh, it says, in, uh, in the eighth month, in the second year, Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edu, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been the source of please, let's go on down. It says, uh, says uh, he, okay, then, then it says, Upon the four and twentieth day, okay, we're in verse seven, upon the four and twentieth day, the eleventh month, which is the month Sabbath, which is actually uh, the month of. Uh, of uh, Adar, all right? In the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, said, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him, there were three, there were red, there were red horses speckled in white. And it goes on, talks about how that he walked, uh, they walked through, uh, uh, they stood, by, the, there was a man that stood among the myrtle trees. So literally, there was a man that was standing in the middle of the myrtle trees, in the middle of, of this uh, of, of Adasa. So Esther is again pointing us back, pointing us to to a uh, to a time that is at, at the end. So there is going to be this there is going to be this time that uh, that we have that. So Esther is prophetic. Esther is prophetic. So here's what I'm going to going to submit to you about the book of Esther. Is I believe that we can look at these characters that are there, and we can we can see some things that are really going to speak to us. We've already identified Haman as the Antichrist spirit, but let's let's look at some other things here. We have we have Esther, who is hiding her identity, and I believe that this is the this is the people the Esther represents the people that are left behind there are two two books in the Bible that are written by women one is Ruth the other is Esther Ruth tells us about the 2,000 years of Gentile uh, time on this earth where the Gentiles are, are, are uh, the Gentile believers are, are in mass and, we, and we've actually separated ourselves from the Jewish brethren by the way uh, I think find that interesting that we separated ourselves from, our, from the Jewish brethren and of course they separated us from, from us as well the Council of John, you know, they, they separated from us, and then later on, in, uh, at, at, the council, uh, at the Council of, uh, uh, of uh, Nicene, the Nicene Council, we, we uh, put the final, uh, final separation between us and, and the Jewish people as, as a, as a uh, body of believers. And so, uh, uh, so uh, this time period is the time of the Gentiles time when the Gentiles are, are, are going to be the primary uh, worshiper of God. It doesn't mean that there isn't Jewish people out there that are, aren't, are, aren't worshiping. Uh, it just means that, that, you know, that there is a larger group of us that are Gentiles, all right? But here's the interesting, interesting thing, is that Esther is hidden. In fact, her identity is hidden. And if there's ever been a time in the history, it's right now, when the believers in Jesus, their identity is really hidden. They have no idea about their Hebrew roots. They have no idea. They have completely put a mask on. And they are something that they never, never was before. I believe that Esther is those people that get left behind after the rapture. And uh, we're going to look, there's something about the 180 days that's, that's very interesting here. So, that, uh, we'll just say that that's Esther. So Esther, Esther then, let's just, for, for, for the time being, let's just accept that, that Esther is those that are left behind. Both, 
both Jewish and Gentile, that are left behind. All right. Then we have King Ahasuerus. And King Ahasuerus is, uh, is, is interesting because the interesting thing about this is that the Jewish people, when they say that, that uh, it's talking about the king, that is talking about not only King Ahasuerus, but it's also talking about the king of kings. It's also talking about God himself. So they understand Ahasuerus as a type of God, God the Father. So that, that's not hard for us to understand. Which is interesting because if that's true, then you look at that and you think, wow, you know, this king, he almost, he almost looks like an idiot, doesn't he? I mean, he passes laws that he doesn't mean to pass. He gives people authority that really don't, don't belong, you don't need the authority. He, he, he doesn't, he, you know, his decision seems to be like he's always having to ask somebody else, to, you know, what, what, what should I do? Is he king or not, right? The other thing about, about this king is that he has laws that cannot be reversed. Right. Why in the world would you want to have laws that can't be reversed? I mean, what, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it, you know, wouldn't it be more sensible to have laws that you could actually reverse? It appears on the service that the king is an idiot. And that, that all these things are going on. But see, I want to tell you something. I think that this ages, this answers some questions for us. Answers some really old questions for us. For instance, why does God put the tree in the Garden of Eden when he knows that Adam and Eve are going to eat the tree? I mean, that sounds kind of ridiculous. So, why does he have that? And here's another one. Do you think a loving God would send somebody to hell? And why do we have to? Why did He have to send His Son to do die to on the cross? Would, couldn't there be a different way? Why did it have to be so brutal and so so terrible? Why why did He have to have this plan that that, that included all this? Why? What was the purpose of all this? And so, sometimes, you know, when we ask these questions, what we're actually saying, God, you're an idiot. <laughs> and I want to submit to you, we don't understand God. His ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We don't understand Him. But I want to tell you something. When we say these things, what we're actually saying is this. God, why don't you just take away gravity? Why don't you take away the law of physics, motion, and everything else that defines the way existence on the universe is? Why don't you just... Change all the laws. Why don't you make this a better place? Why do why why can't we all just go to heaven? This story tells us that the laws of God are eternal. Yeshua said that he came not to abolish the law but to fulfill it. Every dot and every tittle, every T will be crossed, every I will be dotted. The law will be served. This is what this book is telling us. There is a mighty plan of redemption and the law has a lot to do with it. And no more can we change Gravity or the or any or the laws of physics, no more than can we change that, no more can we change the law. The law cannot be changed. 
And this book tells us the law cannot be changed. Once a law is a law, it's a law. And even the king, even God himself, cannot go against his own word. Can God go against his own law? So the Torah is forever. So this book is talking about the Torah being forever. But here's the interesting thing. Esther is hiding. And now here's the interesting thing about Esther too. Is that when, when, Daniel, went into, when Daniel went into uh, uh, Babylonian captivity, he doesn't eat any of, the, any of the king's meats. He doesn't even wear, wear, wear the clothes, right? Mm -hmm. he, he's, he stays kosher. He, he follows all the, all the rules. He follows the law. Esther doesn't. Esther goes in, she allows them to go through a year of purification, and she gets all ready for the king. She's eating in the, at, at the table with the king. She's, she's preparing feast for the king. She's probably having pork and shellfish and everything else. We start off with the book of Esther with a big feast that uh, that Alcasparis is having. And he has this feast for 180 days. That's six months. Does anybody know where you might have heard 180 days before? Well, over in Daniel, I will, for the sake of time, we're not going to go there, but Daniel talks about times, time and times, and, time and, and a half a time. Well, a half a time is 180 days. A time is 360 days, and times is 720 days, which added together makes three and a half years. What happens at the mid part of the seven year tribulation? Three and a half years. So at the mid part of the tribulation, he's talking about that, 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 which added together makes three and a half years. What happens at the mid part of the seven year tribulation? Three and a half years. So at the mid part of the tribulation, he's talking that, 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 that there's going to be a seven-day feast. Now, uh, you know, you can almost get a mid-trip mid -trip, uh, rapture here, right? All right? I think that we're, we're raptured uh, before the tribulation. But anyway, you know, nevertheless, they, 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 this, this could e even easily support that. Yeah. Some people believe it. Some people believe it. I don't believe it. I believe that, that we're going to be pre-trip. I think we're going to be uh, before the seven years. I think we're going to be up in, in heaven, having it on banquet. But anyway. So, so we have 180 days here, and at the end of the feast, he has another feast for seven more days. Now, do you know what's going on with this feast? Historians, the historians have brought this out, that, that uh, during this feast, what, uh, what uh, King Ancasferis is doing is he's bringing everybody in, and they're actually planning a big battle. They're actually using this, this time, this 180 days, to plan for this battle. Isn't there something? There's going to be a battle. At the end Amen. of the day, and God Himself is That's planning right. for a battle right now. All right, King, our King Ahasuerus up in heaven is planning for a battle. All right, and so at the end of that, there is a seven-day feast. A seven-day feast. On the seventh day of the feast, He calls for Vashti. Now Vashti. Now Vashti's name means beautiful. What her name means uh, is beautiful. And so he asked for Vashti to come and show her beauty. beauty. And what does that what, what does Vashti do? She refuses. Because Vashti is having her own feast. I'm gonna tell you something, I'm gonna submit this to you. Today is the Sabbath. It's the seventh day. And God is calling us to come into his presence. Because he wants to show our, show the beauty of his creation. He wants to look upon us. He wants to see us in our beauty. He wants to see the beauty of Yahweh in us reflected back to him. Because what does Vashti have that the king did not give her? Everything that she has. All of her jewels, all of her clothes, all of her, everything that she has is, is because the king gave it to her. She doesn't. She didn't bring anything in. Neither did, did Esther later on. She didn't bring anything in. The king gives everything. And so God has given us everything. And he asks us to come in to, sh to, show, our, to show our beauty to him. To show the beauty that he's given to us back to him. But yet, you know what we do? We're just like Vashti. No, no, no. I'll get my own feast. 
It's on Sunday. I've got my own goon little group. I've got my own women over here. You're planning a, a, a battle. We don't want to have anything to do with battle. We, we're, we're over here with love and joy and peace and long-suffering and goodness and faith and all that stuff. We're over here loving each other. And we're, we're not in the battle part. No, no, no. And, and plus, plus, you know, we're doing our own thing. And Bastia gets rejected. Now, I believe that that's, that's one aspect of looking at it, but another aspect of looking at it is that Vashti is Israel that was rejected as the first wife. So Vashti is the rejected wife that was rejected because she would not come into the kingdom. When the king of Yeshua came, she would not come. She wouldn't come in the Old Testament. She wouldn't come in uh, uh, when, when he was here. She wouldn't come. And so he, he, he expels her and he, uh, he wouldn't let her, wouldn't let her have it. The interesting thing is, this court is, is talking about all kinds of tape, tapestry and, and, and colors and everything because God wants you to know what he has in store for you. This is just a small picture of what... And do you know that there are seven things that are listed here? Seven is a perfect number, isn't it? All right, so that's kind of interesting. There are seven chamberlains, seven princes... Uh, of why the seven princes are interesting, I believe the seven princes are the seven spirits of God. But that's uh, that, 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 I don't want to get into all that. All right, so so we have this. So we have Vashti. She has been she has been take, taken out, and they have the beauty a beauty contest. And who would win but Adassa? Adassa wins the beauty contest. And so Mordecai. Now who's Mordecai? Well, I believe Mordecai yeah. is Yeshua. Yes. He's the one. He's the one that stays close to Esther. In the in the book of Ruth, we have Boaz as the kinsman redeemer who marries Ruth, who then raises up a child, and the child is placed upon the lap of Naomi, and so Naomi, by by that transfer, has has, her, has a child. That way, and so the. Uh, but then we have in Esther, we have we have Mordecai, and Mordecai is 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 the uncle. He's not married to her, but he takes care of her. Yeah. He takes care of her. He is a redeemer. He is a kinsman redeemer, because Esther is an orphan. She doesn't have a mother or a father. And so the um, so so Mordecai takes the takes the role of the kinsman redeemer for Esther. So Mordecai now, and if you can look at that, he is, he is Jesus. Alright. So, we go along, we got, we got, uh, we got here, um, let me, let me make sure I'm getting this right. Okay, so they had the beauty contest, and she's prepared. Uh, she actually goes into the house in the tenth month of the Hebrew year. And then we have this thing that happens. Mordecai is sitting at the at the gate of the city, so it must have been fairly important of a person to be sitting in the gate, because that's where the judges, that's where the that's where the important people sit. So it must have been pretty important. And he's sitting there, and he overhears the conversation between two of the of the chamberlains, and he hears them. Uh, plotting um, to murder King Ahasuerus. You, you ever see the movie God's Not Dead? <laughs> you know, here, 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 years ago, you know, they had God dead, right? They, they had a, and, and I want to tell you something. There's a, there's a, there's a bunch of people today that would love to murder God. They would love to take God completely out of everything. Just take him out, of, take him away from our money, take him away from our system, take him, off, take his name off from the, uh, from our, our, our public buildings. And, and they're, they're trying with everything that they can. There's a big plot that is wanting to kill God, to kill King of the Well, name, uh, uh, um, Mordecai hears this plot, and he tells one of the one of the servants who tells, then takes that message to uh, to Esther. Esther then has a, has somebody go to the king and tell the king. You know, hey, you know, uh, uh, you know, somebody's trying to kill you. 
Well, so we have some, we have a we have a salvation that happened. He saved the king, but he's not rewarded. It's going to be good here in a little yeah. bit. <laughs> All right. So then, then the next thing that happened. So, so these two guys are hanging on a tree. So we got the first hanging, right? We got the first hanging. So they're hanging on the tree, and it's a question whether they were hung by the neck or actually impaled. It doesn't really matter. They were they 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 they, they were put on a stake somehow or another. All right. After these things, King Achas, uh, 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 um, this is chapter three, Achasuerus he promoted Haman. So now Haman gets promoted, and uh, so Haman gets promoted, and he gets all above all the princes, and so everybody's supposed to bow to him. Now it's it's not that not that terrible to bow to somebody as a, as a respect, but so the, the Jewish uh, rabbis believe that Haman must have put a god around his neck. And so that when some people were bowing, they were actually bowing before his God, his idol. And so Mordecai would not bow. He would not bow. Well, this just enraged Haman to no end. And so Haman now not only plots to kill Mordecai, but every Jew in the entire region of Persia. Now, I showed you the map. Persia also included Jerusalem, so that would have also meant that he wanted to kill Nehemiah, Ezra, Zerubbabel, Daniel, everybody. All right. Wow. So then they have a fast. Mordecai starts fasting with everybody, and they start fasting. But listen, when is they fasting? Now, they, uh, Haman, Haman cast this lot and everything. All right, it's going to be on the 13th day. It's going to be on the 11th one. All right, the king and him. Uh, uh, and then, uh, all right, then we go. Then we go. Uh, they're they're fasting, and uh, Mordecai is has rent his clothes and he's put on sackcloth. And we're in chapter four now. He's put on sackcloth and he's sitting at the king's gate. He's sitting in the front of the king's gate. So somebody sees sees him out there and said to, oh, tells tells Esther, Esther, your uncle, your Mordecai is out there in sackcloth, and so uh, Esther then sends him clothes. <laughs> Get dressed, Mordecai. Right, sends him clothes. Don't be fasting. So he sends a message back to her. He says, "Listen, don't you know what, what, what what's going on?" There's been a decree that all the Jews, and don't you think that you're going to escape? And he says, I want you to reveal yourself to the king. This is so interesting because this is where the story really turns around and gets really fast. Now, everything starts happening real fast once this happens. Up till now, everything's been kind of slowly moving along, but now everything starts happening really quick. Fast, quick, and in a hurry. Because what happens is, is... Mordecai, who is Yeshua, is telling Esther, who is the Jewish and Gentile believers that are left behind, it's time to reveal himself. I want to tell you something. I believe that Yeshua is speaking to us today. That it's time for us to reveal ourselves, to reveal the, the, the Hebraic roots that we have in our faith. That it's time for us to stand up strong and stand up bold and, and proud with, uh, about who we are. That we, that we are that we are uh, followers after Yeshua, and Yeshua is 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 our is our is our Lord and Savior, and that we have we, that we are tied to Abraham, and we're tied, and we we celebrate the the Sabbath, and we we celebrate the feast days, and we celebrate those things because this is this is tie, tying us back to back, back to Abraham and back to back to what God is doing. If everything if everything from the Antichrist goes all the way back to uh, Esau uh, J Esau and Jacob. How much more should we also be tying ourselves back to the to to our original roots? It's about roots. I'm going to tell you the age-old conflicts are not over. We're still experiencing them, and so we have this this their 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 fasting, and then then uh, they so Mordecai sends a message here. He says, oh, Esther, I want you to go before the king." And I want you to plead and supplicate for your people. 
for your people. I want you, to, because now, Esther, it's time for you to reveal yourself to the king. Reveal yourself to the Father. And so she says, I, I will do that. If I perish, I perish. Isn't that the cry of every person that truly loves Yeshua? Is that regardless of what you ask me to do, Yeshua, I will do it. Even if it costs my life, I don't care. We have a grandson that that uh, is a missionary to, uh, to China. And he's home now. He, he, they came home to give birth to their uh, their child. and But they are planning on going back this following year. Part of us want to say, please don't. But the other part of us understands that if Yeshua says for us to do it, if I perish, I perish. I will do whatever He asks me to do. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter the hardship. Doesn't matter the, the difficulty. Doesn't matter the pain. Doesn't matter anything. You're the captain. And whatever you say, I will do. Esther is saying that to Mordecai. If I perish, I perish. He goes into the king, and the king holds out the scepter. That's the first time that the king holds out the scepter in this book. I want to tell you something. I believe that those that, that that's interesting how that was in. I'll talk about that in just a moment. And she goes in and, and the king says, What do you want? We asked her. Up to half the kingdom. <laughs> it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Up to half the kingdom, I'll give it to you. She says, I just want you and Haman to come to a dinner that I would prepare. A feast. And so the king is just thrilled. Yeah, we'll come. Haman is really, man, he goes home, he's just delighted. He's just thinking, this is the greatest thing. So we got this 24 hour period wait now. Alright? So they go to the feast. They go to the feast and they get through eating. And uh, uh, they, so we after the first feast, he, the king says, this, he says, says uh, well, Esther, what do you want? What do you want? She said, oh, I want you to come again tomorrow to another feast. So Haman is just really excited. He goes, leaves that feast, he walks out the door, and who does he run into? <laughs> Runs into Mordecai. And he's angry. But he holds his peace, he doesn't say anything, he just goes on home, and then he tells his wife, he says, he says, man, you know, about all this thing, about how the king is, you know, honoring him, and boy, you know, he's just getting no more and more stuff going on. And his wife, you know, they, they're all excited. And that night, the king, Ahasuerus, cannot sleep. And so he asked for them to bring the book of the records to him. There's a book of remembrance that is written for every place, everybody that it speaks about the about God today. And he brings that book, book, book to, to King, and, and they read him about how that Mordecai had saved the king. Well, in, it, while, while he's having this dream, Haman is talking to his wife, and he's telling him, telling him about this Mordecai, and he says, he said, all these things are great. He said, but man, as long as, uh, Mordecai, as, more as Mordecai is around, I, I, this just takes us away from me. And she said, well, why don't you build a gallows? I mean, you know, you've been all this, you know, build a gallows and hang Mordecai. So they built a, uh, a gallows 75 feet tall. <laughs> 75 feet tall. Because what he wants to do is he wants to be able to be at the dinner looking out the window and seeing Haman hanging on the gallows. And so he'd have not only the, not only the joy of the dinner, but also the joy of seeing his enemy on. Huh? They go to, they, but he, so he goes to the king early in the morning to, I suppose, get permission to have this gallows made, all right? So he goes in there and court, well, it so happened that the king is just now hearing about this whole thing, about this, about the, that, that Mordecai hasn't been honored. So he says, who's in the court? He said, well, Haman just walked in. 
Boy, this is coincidence, isn't it? Haman just walked in. So he brings Haman in and says, Who would you who what, what should the king do that shows shows honor to somebody? And Haman says, Who else would he want the honor but me? Oh, bring out the bring out the royal kingly robes and put the kingly robes on me. And put you put that person upon a horse and lead him through the city and shout, This is the one way that we treat somebody who God wants to honor. And then King Ahasuerus says, go and do exactly that to Mordecai. <laughs> Mordecai is the show. There was a time when Yeshua hung upon the cross. And he was not, not he was not honored by the Jewish people for what he did to them. Now he's being honored. For two thousand years he's been in sackcloth and ashes. Unrecognizable to who he is. Because he's been covered over with ashes. I find it interesting we just had Ash Wednesday. And Yeshua has been covered over with ashes. You would not recognize, the Jewish people would not recognize the Jesus that we, serve, that we have been preaching for 2,000 years. Right. Right. They don't recognize him. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you something. We're revealing him for who he is. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Hallelujah. He is the Jewish Messiah. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He is Israel's stock of oh, Jacob. Oh yes, Father. Thank you, Lord. He is the bright and morning star. Yes, he is. He is the one that is walking among the myrtle trees. Son. He is the one that is coming again. On a white horse. Yes, with his name written on the side. He is the one that is coming. And he is Yeshua. Yes, <laughs> He was born a Jew. He lived a Jew. He died as a Jew. And he's coming back as a Jew. Yes, Lord. My God. He's from the tribe of Judah. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. A Jewish tribe. <laughs> yes, he is. Hallelujah. And I'm proud to be a, a member of the family of a Jewish community where we uh, worship uh, Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Haman goes home. He says, oh, this day has been a terrible day. This is the worst day of my life. His wife says, Oh my, my, my life, if, if Mordecai if Mordecai is a Jew, this is going to be bad. You're going to fall underneath this one. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Antichrist will fall. He will fall. Oh, yes, yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yeshua comes riding on the white horse, I want to tell you, with his kingly robes on him. Mm he -hmm. will fall. About that time, they came and got here came Haman and hurried him to the second banquet. Can you imagine? So he gets to the second banquet, Esther. Now, so now we've had this twenty-four hour period, <laughs> and then there's and so now they got the second banquet. Haman is in there, and he's 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 sitting there, and they're they're, they're eating and everything, and, and and the king says, Esther, what did you want? I'll have to have the kingdom. I'll give it to you. He says, she says, oh. My people have been sold. My people have been sold. And they are going to be destroyed. And the king says, who would do such a thing to the queen and to her people? Who would do such a thing? He said, that wicked man 
They covered his face because he was a dead man. And they hung him on the gallows that he had made for Mordecai. But now there's still a problem. There's this law. And the law is a law. It cannot be changed. It's the law of sin and death. It's the law. It's the law that if you if you break the Torah, you're, you 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 have to die. That there's only one there's only one thing that can even save you, and that's that's blood, right? And so Esther comes to the king, and she says, and she comes the second time, and he holds out the scepter a second. And I believe that this is a prophecy talking about the second time that God will hold out a scepter again to the Jewish nation and all Israel will be saved. This is the time of the end when all Israel shall be saved. And he's holding out the scepter the second time to Esther. And Esther says to him, says, says, we've got this problem. This law is about death. So they made a new law. But I want you to notice something. It's a new law that returned back to the original intent of the first one. Before the first one was actually necessary. What law was that? It was a law between Abraham and Melchizedek. That was in a covenant. And a priesthood under Mount Pesetic that was established prior to the priesthood of Aaron. So the new law takes us back before the first law. But it doesn't it doesn't it negate the Torah. It doesn't negate the old law. It brings us to something better than the old law. But it includes the old law, but with better promises. And it takes us back to the order of Melchizedek, who was before Moses. So everything that is in the Torah is still applicable for our lives. There are some things that cannot be done because I'm a male and not a female, so I can't do the do the loss and the doubt. I can't do the washing after after uh, after uh, you know, once a month. I can't go do a mikvah once a month. It doesn't wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't avail me anything. I can do a mikvah, but not for that particular person pur purpose. So I don't have that. I don't have a temple, so there's things I can't I can't offer sacrifices. So there's things that I can't do. There are things that I physically am not able to do. If you're a woman, you can't do things that the man, man is required to do under the law. So they can't, there's nobody that, that it's, but the law is still there. But we're to do everything we can do. We're to perform every part of the law that we're able to perform. And that includes the laws of what we eat. That includes the laws of what day we worship. That was, includes the law of, of, of many, many things. So the law is still there, but we have a new law that encompasses everything that was before the, that law. Isn't that interesting? So they write up a new law. And because of that, many of the Jews, many of the people, many of the Persians become Jews that day. And then it's, isn't it interesting that in the end time there's going to be this great revival, and I believe that we're, we're, we're beginning to see the ground swelling of that. But we're going to see Jews and Gentiles coming to Yeshua because they understand the new law, and that that we need we knew that we need the new law. We need the brick of uh, Shah. We need the new covenant, the renewed covenant that is there. And of course, then they have uh, they have this time on 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 uh, on the day of Adar 
uh, 14th day of Adar, 13th and 14th, called Purim, and they celebrate that. And they celebrate that. So this is this is what I want to end today. Is that I believe that uh, I believe that we're living right now in this time where we're going to have this um, period of time when, when we're uh, when we're experiencing a lot of different difficulties. And you're going to have uh, you're going to have the uh, Antichrist. You're going to have a lot of things going on. But uh, I believe that what Esther is telling us is that at the time of the Antichrist, it's going to look like that God is hidden. When the Antichrist reveals himself, it's going to look like God is nowhere to be found. It's going to look that way. But I'm telling you, there's coming a day when the myrtle tree will be waved. And he will say, I will rescue you. I will deliver you. And I will relieve the pain of my people. No plan of the enemy can over, overcome what I say. And I just want, want, want to leave you with this, that we may be entering in some dark days prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus. We may be seeing some things that are happening in the world on the world scene that may be distressing. It may cause people to fear. But I'm telling you something. God is behind the scenes. There is a day of redemption that is coming for His people. Jesus said, when you see all of these things, look up. For your redemption draws nigh. We're to look up. You know, recently we've had this uh, coronavirus thing. I'm telling you, look up. Look up. I don't know if this is, if this is going to be the end of the end of the end of the end. I don't know. But I'm going to be ready. I don't want to be like the virgins that don't have their oil in their lamps. I want to be ready. Because I believe right now we are living in the book of Esther. We're living in the time when Haman is going to be exalted. Very soon, when the Antichrist will show his, show his face, he's already here. We just don't know if this is going to be the one or not. All right? Because not even you or I know the day or the hour. We know the season. But we, don't, we, we might know the month. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. But I want to tell you something. He's coming. And I believe he's going to come on the book in the month of Tishrei. I believe he's going to come in September. So this is a time to rejoice. Amen. It's not a time to be afraid and worried and wringing our hands over over this or that and being being cautious here and cautious there. No, this is a time when we when we should be shining like stars in the in the firmament. We should we should be like we should be like Esther the star and shine in this pagan world that we live in. Let our light shine. Reveal who we are to the world, and let people know that Esther, Esther us, <coughs> that we are in love with Mordecai, and we will do whatever he asks us to do. If we perish, we perish. This is all stand. I know it was a long one. I don't even know how long I went, but probably not over an hour, for sure. Don't worry about it. I just want to tell you something. Brother Ray spent three weeks. And it's not an accident that he finished up when he did. Because when he finished up, right here at the time of Purim. And everything he said set, set, that set it up for me. Made it easier for me. I didn't have to cover a lot of things because he had already covered it. But I'll tell you, the last four weeks of teaching has been ordered by God and orchestrated by God. God is trying to give us a message. Be, be aware. Look up. I'm doing something right now. Get your spiritual eyes open. 
and get closer to Yeshua than you ever have been in your entire life. Even if you're so close now that you don't think you can get any closer, get closer. Press in. Get closer than you ever have. Is a time to put away worldly things and get spiritually minded. Is a time to let go of things. Rise up, O men of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your blessings in our life. We thank you, Lord, for being here with us. Thank you for your spirit, O oh God, Lord, that you've given to us. We give you honor, we give you praise, we give you glory. In Yeshua's mighty name. Yilrecheke Yahweh v'yishmerecha. Yair Yahweh p'nav v'lecha v'ikonecha. Yisa Yahweh p'nav v'lecha v'yaseim l'kant shalom. The Lord will bless you and He will keep you. The Lord will make His face to shine upon you and He will be gracious to you. The Lord will lift His countenance upon you. And he will give you peace. Amen.